in that. So, uh, if, oops. Um, so this means that when I um, started approaching a uh, heavy metal, not only did I think of um, this when I started approaching Egypt, sorry, or this, I also had this in my head from the from the very beginning. Um, so I um, wrote an article, as uh, Jeremy mentioned, on um, uh, on Egypt in metal, and I studied that from the point of view of transgression and different types of transgressions that are used in the in the use of heavy metal. But in this presentation, I want to do something shorter, something um, uh, more to the point, because I don't have time for any more. Um, and I want to study um, or present how and also why uh, um, heavy metal uses Egyptian imagery, but more, more, more importantly, I think I want to explore what the implications of the uses of that uh, imagery of, of ancient Egypt may be. And uh, well, it will come as no surprise because the title of this roundtable is Orientalism, that I want to use uh, Orientalism um, as, a, as a framework to study this. Um, so earlier in this um, conference today, we have been learning about um, decolonial, uh, decolonial discourses. Um, but here, I want to go back to that initial framework of colonialism and how that colonialism has created narratives and, and representations of ancient cultures, and in this case, ancient Egypt. Egypt. Um, so I apologize, I don't want to sound patronizing to anyone here, but I'm going to go back to the very beginning and I'm going to say a few words about Edward Said and Orientalism that I'm sure will be known to many of you, but I don't want to assume anything. Perhaps some of you are not familiar with his work. So um, Said is um, best known for his work, uh, for his book in 1978, Orientalism, and this would sow the seeds for post-colonial studies, basically. Um, and we could advance many criticisms to Orientalism. Um, I mean, that is denying agency of, uh, of many people. Well, never mind. Um, this is something that I think we can discuss later in the round table if, if, if you want. But today, what I want to go, uh, what I want to do is go back to that framework that Said developed and see how this plays uh, onto the um, retellings of Egypt in heavy metal. So first of all, as the name indicates, I think um, Orientalism is related to the Orient. But again, Amanda was saying earlier in one of her interventions, um, um, is this concerning? What is this? What is the, what is the East? What would the West be then? Um, and um, she was definitely spot on because we need to ask ourselves what the Orient is. And if you think yourselves what the Orient may be for you, I'm sure many of you will have different ideas in your head and different images in your head. For many of you will be thinking perhaps of uh, Japan, India, in my case, I would be thinking of Egypt probably. Uh, there are many different places that have actually nothing to do with each other, but they all get subsumed within a category that we call Orientalism, and that we call, excuse, excuse me, that we call the, the Orient, um, which we use almost like an umbrella term to refer to all those um, different cultures. And um, Said explained this phenomenon from the perspective of um, imagined geographies. Um, so he was claiming that the Orient itself does not exist. It's basically a category that uh, Western scholars have created by bundling together a number of different cultures in a very artificial way. And in this sense, he was saying that the Orient is not a place, it is an idea. And this is also stemming from these ideas of colonial domination that we can uh, perhaps will have the time to go into a bit later. So um, the Orientalism studies the Orient, but how does it study the Orient? whatever, however we define it. Um, there are three aspects to this theory of Orientalism. First, it is an academic discipline that delineates what that Orient may be. It is a mindset as well, which is based on dichotomies. And also it is an idea or is based on idea of domination and subjugation. And today I want to focus on this, um, the second point on this list, this idea of dichotomies, because we have agreed that the Orient is constructed, it's an idea that has been constructed by, by how, how. And uh, it is uh, constructed as a mirror image of the West on the basis of what we could call tropes of difference. So basically we have two circles here. One represents the East, the other one the West. And where the East is static, the West will be presented as dynamic. Where the East is passive, the West will be active. Uh, where the East is tyrannical, the West will be democratic. 
with the East is religious, the West will be secular and so on and so forth. I mean, we could go on talking about violence, religion, lust. I mean, there is a disproportionate amount of naked women in anything related to Orientalism that you will read. Um, but I guess the point here is clear that these dichotomies are being used in order to otherize the East, basically to present a them in opposition to an us. Um, and this authorization is present in many works, um, really. To understand what I mean, I thought we could do like a short exercise just to, to, to see what Said said. And um, I encourage you to look at this um, painting for a couple of minutes. Um, this is just one random example that I have chosen. I could have chosen uh, many others. But here what we see is a world of contrasts. Uh, we almost feel like the oppressive heat in the painting. We have the hint of the water in the background. Uh, we see different skin tones as well. While the woman um, and the child who seated um, on, the, on the stairs seem almost like ashamed of their of their nakedness we have a woman standing uh, defiant and, and proud she seems perhaps about to be sold into slavery we don't know we see people standing uh, over here in some active um, poses presumably some servants well there is a man displaying his authority and his power we've been very comfortably lying um, on a on a couch um, so this painting, I think, is illustrating some of those ideas that I have mentioned earlier, some of those dichotomies. We see a world of dichotomies because these people are being presented in opposition to the intended audience um, of this painting. And we could go on talking about this painting uh, forever, really. Uh, but what, something that I wanted to, to think about and to focus on is that probably most of you, upon seeing this painting, you thought that this was set in Egypt. And this is not just due to the clothing and to the appearance of some of the people that are depicted here, but it's also, and I think first and foremost, due to the natural and the built landscape that is presented, presented in this painting. We have again the palpable heat, we have the river, but most of all, we have this monumental architecture that is reminiscent of Egypt. We have what appears to be uh, like a massive temple in the background. Uh, you will see the statue of a lion, you will see a statue of the goddess Sehmet behind um, some of these individuals here. And there are two important things to note here, I think. First, this painting is not really depicting any specific place. It is an imagined place again, but it is transmitting a particular idea of Egypt. And also, it's not just about the decoration that we see on this painting, it's also about the scale of some of those buildings, because Egypt has been traditionally seen as a culture of monumentality. And this is very much linked to those ideas of, uh, of tyrants that I mentioned earlier in relation to the Orient um, uh, in opposition to the West. So Egyptians, Egyptian built spaces have been very often used as a backdrop in order to express these ideas of uh, opulence and grandeur um, that are meant to highlight this exoticism um, of Egypt. So in a way, monumental architecture is encapsulating the essence of uh, ancient Egyptian civilization and is used to portray it. But now that we have had a look at this image, a very good look at, at this image, I think we should move to Power Slave again. And I'm sure Power Slave will be known to everyone here in this forum, but just in case you don't know it, this is an album by Iron Maiden from 1984. And um, if you don't know this album please go and check it out it is really good and the title track explores the theme of the curse of the mummy which i argue elsewhere is also related to these ideas of um of orientalism uh, but today i'm mainly interested in the cover and as you can see this is a cover that is beloved by many fans of iron maiden and um members of iron maiden themselves have said that it is their favorite cover here you have uh, this tweet from uh, Bruce Dickinson from uh, last year that says so. And what we have here, I mean, this cover has it all, basically. Uh, we have a mega pyramid, we have a causeway, stairway, colossal statuary, hieroglyphs, and some Easter eggs, by the way. For example, you have Indiana Jones was here, you have a Mickey Mouse somewhere there, and also uh, it's written bollocks in one of the corners there. Um, so, what we have here that is while on the painting that we saw on the previous slide, uh, the architecture was just perhaps the background. Uh, here, what we have is that the, the architecture is, the, is not just the stage, it's the main theme of the cover. Here, monumental architecture is Egypt. 
So a promotional um, material for the for the album also included these references to monumental architecture, and in the inside um, uh, cover of the of the album, we have, for example, this image with the with the band in what looked like a burial chamber inside a pyramid. Um, notice notice the scale of the chamber as well. Uh, interesting prompt death behind them for some reason. Again, Egypt relates to this idea of, uh, of death and the curse of the mummy, mummy up, uh, uh, about to leave the, the coffin. And this focus on, of, of, uh, on architecture was also taken to the stage, both in the World Slavery Tour in the uh, mid 80s, and also in the relatively more recent somewhere back in time uh, world tour in the, um, in the late 2000s, uh, where the on stage, we have almost like a reproduction of one of these ancient Egyptian uh, temples and uh, um, being, being the background to the performance and also it was part of the merchandising for all of this. So uh, we have many other examples of uses of monumental architecture to re recreate Egypt um, in heavy metal. And uh, we have pyramids, temples, um, burial chambers. They are they all feature in this visual vocabulary of metal bands that recreate and perpetuate depictions of Egypt. We have one of my favorite bands here. We have Nile. And um, my esteemed colleague, um, Jeremy Swift, likes to refer to them as an Egyptomaniac band. <laughs> And uh, we have plenty of examples of built um, spaces just to recreate ancient Egypt coming from Nile. We have them in album covers, for example. We have, been, uh, have them on the names of albums. The Catacombs of Nefren Ka is the, um, gives title to this paper, really. And they all refer to architectural spaces as stage, but also as a protagonist of the retellings of ancient Egypt by these bands. Um, and here we see, for example, the covers of one of my favorite albums, Cetephalic, where we see this colossal statue um, uh, at the front with the backdrop of the pyramids. And those pyramids are the ones that are giving us, again, the sense of this being Egypt. Now, coming to the end of the presentation, you may be wondering why I am discussing all of this and how this may be linked to Orientalism. And in order to argue that, let me go back to something that I very sneakily showed you somewhere down the presentation, which is this tweet from Bruce Dickinson that I showed you. Um, he, he's talking about this cover of uh, Power Slave. He's saying this probably his most favorite one of all times. It is a classic. It has inspired their stage performances and it is like ancient Egypt itself. It is eternal and eternally interesting. So what we have here in this comment is that they are reproducing the myth of eternal Egypt. Uh, it's been deployed and reused in reference to the cover of this album that features this monumental architecture. So in this case, monumental architecture, again, is equated with ancient Egypt itself. However, following Said, as we mentioned earlier, this idea of ancient Egypt itself is also an imagined time and an imagined place that we ourselves have created and metal bands continue to reproduce. So these presentations and representations of Egyptian architecture in heavy metal, I think they effectively perpetuate some of these Orientalist tropes uh, that portray Egypt as the other, as a never changing and mystical place where well, as Ronnie James Dio would say, magic was strong and true. And um, I finished my presentation here and I hand over to Lauro.